G'day there guys, it's your main masculine hunk of a hubby Marky, back at it again with another installment of r slash legal advice. Now if you're new to the channel, feel free to subscribe to my amazing, sexy community. Now with that out of the way, I'd love for you to personally sit back, relax, chuck another prawn on the barbie, and get ready for some stories that'll have you begging for more. And our first string of four stories is by user Toronto Apartment Question. Titled, Tenant is renting out my apartment on Airbnb. Tenant isn't responding. Airbnb doesn't care. And my condo board is threatening to fine me for each violation. I have no idea how to even handle this. BOLA posted. Location, Toronto, Ontario. I own an apartment in downtown Toronto. Our building has a bad history of problems with Airbnb tenants. So we voted to ban any sort of short-term rental. Currently, I'm on the other side of the continent for work and won't be back until January. I decided to list my place up for a rental in late August for rental until January. Since the rental time was almost half a year, it doesn't count as a short-term rental. Several people do this in our building and it is fine. I immediately got a hit by a person named Jane who was a student about to start grad school. I don't know if this is true or not, and we talked and decided to agree to the rental. She signed a document indicating she agreed to the building's rules, including the notice about no short-term rentals through services such as Airbnb. Yesterday, I got an email from our property manager. On Monday, they were testing each unit's smoke detectors, and he noticed that there were three people in the unit, along with a strong smell of pot. They apparently identified themselves as Airbnb renters. Apparently, they tried to deny our property manager from entering, since they weren't sure of who he was since they were only renting this place a week through Airbnb. I am violating the rule about no short-term rentals. I am apparently in violation of a bunch of rule violations, such as the fact that more people are staying in my unit than permitted. Apparently, multiple guests have been parking overnight in the visitor's spot, which is not allowed, who all recorded my unit number as the one they are visiting. After getting that email, I called him and confirmed, and I was able to find my place listed on Airbnb using very recent photos of my apartment. I tried to contact Jane through email, which I got no response, phone calls go to voicemail, and Facebook, she blocked me after I sent her a message. I have tried numerous times to talk to Airbnb, but all they have told me is that they can't do anything about this, and basically refuse to do anything about the listing. Aside from all the issues above, frankly I don't feel comfortable with a bunch of random strangers in my apartment at all. Unfortunately, I have no idea even what to do about this legally speaking. Do I have any way to block these random people from entering my units? Edit, I forgot to add that I have talked to a lawyer about evicting the tenant. However, he told me it could take up to two plus months, which is why it won't really help. Since by then, in up to two months, her lease will be over. I want to stop randoms from Airbnb from entering my apartment now. And in the comments, Macy Mum says, well, here is what I do. I would send Airbnb a copy of the condo rules with the relevant rules highlighted. I'd send Airbnb a copy of the lease with the relevant provisions highlighted. I'd then tell Airbnb that if they continue to show your property on their site knowing that it is in violation of both the lease and the abiding condo rules, that you will hold them liable for every fine that you incur and any damage caused by any of the Airbnb guests. I'd send it certified, and if you can actually have a lawyer draft it and send it so much, the better. Includes the notice that you have received from the building. I'll bet they take it down. And our next post is an update about that. So, just wanted to thank you all for your support slash advice. I was really dumb and naive when it comes to renting out my apartment. The last time I rented it out, the tenant left on time and I never actually thought about what could happen if they didn't leave. I have started the process of evicting the tenant today with support from a local lawyer who's going to handle a bunch of the paperwork for me, and represent me. My condo board thankfully has been super understanding as soon as I outlined that it was being done without my knowledge, 
and they have agreed to waive the penalties. Apparently, there were noise complaints on Friday relating to my apartment, which annoyed our condo board. Our concierge service, we have someone at the front desk 24-7, will no longer be allowing people to leave keys for people at the front desk. On Sunday, two people came into the building asking for keys to my unit, and our concierge service asked them if they were Airbnb tenants, and they said yes. He then basically told them to leave right away, and that they aren't welcome here. Jane finally got in touch with me today, and basically accused me of numerous things, from harassing her renters, to just in general making her life difficult. She also stated that she will be going to the LTB to make a formal complaint, because banning Airbnb is not allowed. When I pointed out that as people have told me here that she needs to get my permission before renting out to other people, she went on a rant about how she is doing this for numerous places, and how she has never had a problem, and how stupid I am for making her my enemy. I have a ton of proof of what she's doing. Honestly, my biggest concern is what is going to happen to my apartment. I asked for proof to book my room for one night through Airbnb for tomorrow, as it is just apparently became available for rent, and to take a look at the state of my apartment. And now on to update 2. Thank you for all the wonderful advice especially the fact that I'm allowed to elect someone by proxy to do a unit inspection. I am never going to rent out my room again because this has been a massive battle. My friend rented the room for a single night because my landlord never responded about doing a walkthrough in time, and I was nervous. Turns out someone, not Jane, but someone who identified himself as Jane's co-worker who works for Company X, met my friend in the parking lot. He gave him the keys. I don't know who this person is, but I am not comfortable with some random person having my apartment keys. My friend, ironically, was rejected by the concierge service, who asked him what room he was going to. I forgot to tell my property manager about this. My friend got a full refund from Airbnb, and him and his girlfriend were put up in a nice hotel a few blocks away by Airbnb for the night. My property manager did respond, and was kind enough to do a video walkthrough with me on speakerphone, and honestly, my apartment is not in great shape at all. Apparently, it stinks of cigarettes and weed, and there was a beer can being used as an ashtray, which is not allowed since our apartment building is smoke-free. I have stains slash burns on my couch, which looks like from cigarettes. Airbnb has done nothing, and her listing is still up. I can't find any other listings of hers, though. Jane, however, has been constantly sending me angry emails about how I am impacting her financial situation to how it is making her look bad as an Airbnb host. I told her bluntly the things that I saw from the walkthrough and how it stinks of smoke and weed, and we are a smoke-free building. She claims she never signed any sort of agreement about condo rules and I sent her a picture of the agreement she signed, including the condo rules page. I offered to let her out of the lease, and not pay any more rent money for the remainder of the time on the lease, skipping November slash December, if she left and had the apartment cleaned. She, on the other hand, demanded $5,000 for her to vacate from my apartment early. When I refused, she told me, I will do everything in my power to make your life a living hell for frickin' with me. My lawyer has made the complaint with the LTB, and he thinks it will most likely be resolved by the end of December. This has taught me a hard lesson, and I will never rent my apartment again. Anyways, thanks for the advice. And you thought it was over! Here's the update final! So, officially as of today, Jane has vacated my apartment, and building management has changed the locks. We were able to come to a signed agreement where she agreed to vacate the property within seven days if I refunded her last two months of rent, which is around $4,200, which I did. Honestly, between this and my other legal fees, I am basically in the hole, and I would have been better off not having anyone rent my apartment. I talked to someone who was doing a story on Jane, and they were able to confirm that she apparently works for a company that rents out places on Airbnb. Said person who was doing a story basically told me they weren't going to pursue this anymore due to time concerns. 
She isn't a grad student, nor is she even a student. I don't feel like I won, and honestly, I just feel absolutely infuriated with the entire situation. Airbnb to this day still has my place being listed on Airbnb. Who knows why? Like, she doesn't even have keys anymore. My apartment is a disaster right now, and from what my property manager has stated, it seems like people definitely did smoke in the apartment. There are burns on the couch from cigarettes, my dishwasher is broken, and pretty much everything needs a desperate deep clean. But my apartment is safe, more or less. Anyways, I wanted to thank everyone for your advice. It probably isn't the best ending, but it taught me an extremely valuable lesson. And I can go home at Christmas and hopefully clean my apartment. Well, that wasn't a happy ending, but uh, it is legal advice, not everything has a happy ending. Tell me what you guys thought about that post. That is an interesting series of events. He really got screwed over, and I thought that his lawyer could obviously do more for him. But um, that's weird that they didn't get back at them at all. What do you guys think about that? I think they could have done something for the destruction of property. Like, she obviously broke the contract, the leasing agreement. The least he could have done is gotten money off of her for compensation. Why the hell did he refund her last two months of rent? I'd, I can't understand it. If you guys could tell me, I'd love to know. Anyway, that's the end of my commentary for this. We've got a few more stories to cover now. Uploaded by user AliMG, titled, I just received a demand letter from Enterprise Rented Car, stating that if I do not return their rental car, I will be charged with embezzlement and grand theft auto. I never rented a car from them. This is from San Jose in California. Sir, so I did not rent this car. The letter also states that I rented the car in Sacramento, but I do live in San Jose. My driver's license has not been stolen, and I do not have any credit cards in my name. And I just checked my credit reports online, but do not see anything unusual. I called the manager who sent me this letter, and they told me that I need to file a police report and email it to them as proof that this was not me. I told them that I will do that, but asked if they could provide more information that I can give to the police, because in the letter, it says that the rental was made through a corporate account. However, they will not give me this info, and I am posting to ask you all advice on what steps I should take to approach this before I file the police report this afternoon. I am waiting on my dad to get here to go with me to the station, because I was with him all day on May 29th, and he can vouch I did not do this. Now, we've got a first-hand account from Mary Goldheart in the comments that says, I kind of worked for Enterprise for around three weeks. My company was bought out and we were integrated for a short period of time. And I saw this happen twice in three weeks. That is insane. This seems to be a pretty common thing and the branch manager didn't even bat an eye at it. If it was not clarified, they want a police report for identity theft. This has to go to a special office at corporate and it then unlocks your account, and they drop the whole, we're gonna press charges thing. The reason that it was probably for a corporate account, is that it is extremely easy to fake. Basically, you can call up Enterprise and say, I work for blah blah company, and I have a corporate account with direct billing, and I need a car ASAP. They come out with a tablet, you sign, and you have a car. There's not a huge process of proving you work for the company, especially if it's a large national company. The person may have a fake ID that they made somehow with your identity, and then scammed their way into a corporate car. It would not show up on your credit because no credit card was taken out or involved. That's somewhat what I suspected was the situation there. I don't know, what do you guys think? Also, let's move on to the update. So, thank you to everyone for the advice. I'm also a she, by the way. Many of you thought I was a dude lol, but on to this update. After my initial post, I saw that many of you advised for me to call the manager and demand information from her, because Enterprise is the one at fault and I shouldn't have to go to the police for their mistake. So I did exactly this. And she told me that if I want her to give me more info, I would need to file a police report within 24 hours and email it to her as evidence that I am not the person who rented the car. If not, she would report me for embezzlement and grand theft to the Sacramento police. 
Upon hearing this, I decided to file a report immediately online with the San Jose Police Department. I know many of you said I shouldn't because it's not my fault, but after she told me the consequences, I did not want to take any chances, where I could end up with a warrant on my head. I thought that if anything, filing this report would also prove my innocence if the police actually did come knocking on my door. After filing it, I emailed her the copy and she responded the next day, saying that she said it was in the clear and finally gave me information about what had happened. On May 29, a woman claiming to be me had come in to rent out a black Cadillac. She showed the representative her driver's license that had my information on it and paid for the car rental upfront with cash. I thought you'd need a credit card to do this, but apparently you can just use cash. The manager also says that she has video surveillance of the woman, which she will turn into the Sacramento police later in the afternoon. The following morning, she emailed me the number of her report, which she filed as fraud, and said that the police opened up an investigation, which she will keep me updated on. At this point, I was relieved to be in the clear, yet also ticked that some woman is out there impersonating me. I then started contemplating about taking a three-hour drive to Sacramento to see who the hell this woman is. However, turns out I didn't have to because two hours later, the San Jose police did show up knocking on my front door. Two policemen and two CHP officers. Before opening it, the first thing I did was grab a copy of the police report I printed because I seriously thought that they were going to arrest me two squad cars, four officers, and one me. When I open the door, the first thing they ask me is if name of the woman who I don't know lives at my home. I tell them no, and that I have no idea who that is. Then they ask me if I am Ali MG, and I tell them that I am. They begin to inform me about a car accident that happened in the nearby town of Fremont that morning. The accident was a hit and run, with the driver fleeing the scene but she dropped her driver's license, which they found on the floor. They then asked her to show the license to me, and it's an exact replica of my driver's license. And I ask them how this is possible, if I have my license in my wallet. They then tell me to go grab it, and after comparing the two side by side, one of them tells the others that the one they have is a fake. The black strip is on theirs is chipping, but mine isn't. It's not supposed to chip, by the way. I then ask them if the driver was the woman who stole the car from Enterprise, and they ask me to elaborate, which is when I hand them my report. I explain what happened, which prompts them to give me more details about the accident, and they tell me that the woman who was driving a stolen car and crashed into another vehicle, but she fled the scene in the black Cadillac from Enterprise. So basically the rental car was used as the getaway car, and was identified by the witness in the other vehicle. I told the officers that I had a plate number of the vehicle in the demand letter, and put the info down as well. I then asked them who is the name of the woman I don't know, and they told me that she is the one who stole the car. However, I'm not sure how they know that, fingerprints maybe? But they did show me her mugshot, and we do not look alike at all. I don't know how the hell she was able to rent the car in the first place, but whoever rented it to her probably didn't even check for a comparison. But after this, the woman then thanked me and told me that they'll call me when there's an update on the case. I do have her name now though, and after doing a Google search, I found her Facebook and other social media accounts. I'm very tempted to message her, but I've decided to leave this to the police, because I have no idea who this tramp is, and I don't know if she's dangerous. She might be gang affiliated or something, and she does know where I live. However, I do hope that they catch this tramp, and will update you all when this happens. Spoiler alert, that last one was posted a year ago, and she's not gonna update you, unfortunately. That's the worst part of this all. Oh god. I didn't even intend for this to be a cliffhanger, I'm really sorry guys. Anyway, our last post is by user Carl Dubs, titled, Girlfriend was arrested with a DUI, but blew a .06. Cop arrested her after making her remove her glasses for the sobriety test. So, my girlfriend went out for a couple of drinks with her friend tonight. She didn't drink much, and she waited until she knew she was sober to drive home. 
When the time came, she drove herself and her roommate home in her roommate's car. Well, was headed home. On her way, she noticed that the headlights were off and flipped them on a couple blocks down the road. A minute or two later, she was pulled over by a police officer. She admitted to having a couple of drinks and the officer asked her to get out of the vehicle. This is when it gets interesting. The officer made her take her glasses off in the dark during a snowstorm to perform the sobriety test. He then declared that she was drunk without having her blow to test her BAC and arrested her on the spot and took her to jail. Then, at the jail, she blew a .06. That is below the legal limit, where in Wyoming. And the lady at the booking desk told her to get an attorney when she heard what her blood alcohol content was. My question is, does she have a decent chance to be ruled innocent in a court of law? We have no money and probably can't afford a good lawyer. I could barely afford to her bail. She's on track to be a school teacher and blowing a .06 shouldn't deter her from pursuing her dream. Any advice would be greatly appreciated right now. We have two weeks before she has to appear in municipal court. Edit. She also told me this morning when he arrested her, he didn't tell her her Miranda rights. Found out he doesn't need to. Well, that's just stupid, isn't it? Edit. Thank you all so much for all the help. Edit. I am against drunk and unsafe driving, and so is my girlfriend. In this situation, she believed that she was good to drive and would not harm anyone. It was a crappy situation all round, and she wishes that she had just walked or taken an Uber. Updates. After reviewing the body cam footage, I'm surprised that body cam footage didn't malfunction or just disappear, not gonna lie. The prosecutor dismissed the case. I haven't seen the footage myself, but according to her lawyer, it was clear that she was not impaired. Bravo, bravo, bravissimo. That's a good way to end that story. I love that. Anyway, guys, that is the end of the story today. I hope you've enjoyed my little quips and my little takes on these stories. Tell me what you thought of it down below. I like making legal advice videos. They're really different from just no mother-in-law. Not to say that I don't like those making those videos, but you know, it's something different. It's spicy. It's new kind of content. I hope you guys have enjoyed it so far. I hope you all have a good day, night, sleep, whatever you're up to. And I'll see you in the next episode, guys. Bye.